Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Aaron. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today, I've chosen a holiday episode from Candy Matson, Yukon 28209, Jack Frost. The San Francisco-based detective program was created by husband and wife team Monty and Natalie Masters. Monty wrote the tongue-in-cheek scripts, and Natalie starred as Private Eye Candy Matson. The scripts were packed with snappy dialogue, local references, and a cast of lovably over-the-top characters, including Candy's eccentric photographer pal, Rembrandt Watson, played by Natalie's real-life uncle, Jack Thomas. Candy Matson, Yukon 28209, premiered June 30th, 1949 on NBC West Coast affiliate KNBC. Despite its popularity with local listeners, Candy Matts never found a national sponsor. The final episode, Candy's Last Case, aired April 29th, 1951. Sadly, of the 92 episodes produced, only 14 are known to be in circulation today. And now let's listen to Jack Frost from Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. First broadcast, December 10th, 1949. It's late at night and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Candy? Candy, over here. What? Why, Myra Fisher. What are you doing here in a department store with your work clothes on? I work here, dear. I'm a wage slave. Well, I must say on you, it looks good. What do you slave at? I'm head of advertising and promotion. Well, quite a spot, hey, girl? Well, it was until this morning. Oh? Now my neck is in the fire. What'd you do? Forget to proofread one of your ads? Nothing so trivial, dear, believe me. But am I glad to have bumped into you? Maybe you'll change your mind when I tell you I've been shoplifting. No, I'm serious, Candy. Uh, Could you spare a moment and come on up to my office? Why, sure. And wipe that frown from off your brow. It's wrinkling your makeup. Well, yours would wrinkle, too, if you had a missing Santa Claus helper on your hands. Well, well, now, there's a situation. And it almost broke Candy Matson's heart when someone told her there was no Santa Claus's helper, one Jack Frost. Listen, here she is now to tell you about it. That's right, what the man said. I ran into a deal where we had a missing Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. The gent with the icicles was supposed to talk to the tiny tots at the Brownstone, one of San Francisco's larger and classier department stores. I had gone down there that afternoon shopping. I wanted a bow tie for my old pal Inspector Ray Mallard of the San Francisco Police Department. A bow tie that lit up and spelled Cossack when you pressed the button on the battery. That was when I bumped into this gal, Myra Fisher. We went up to her office on the sixth floor and she sat me down. Cigaretted me, too. You think I'm fooling about this Jack Frost thing, don't you, Candy? Well, now, look, dear, we all have our little peccadilloes. Yours just merely happens to be a missing Jack Frost. You'll get over it. I refrain from hurling this ashtray at you, Candy, only because of our long acquaintance. Good. Now, listen to me. We've had a Santa Claus helper here for almost a month, and a darn good one. The kids were crazy about him. This morning, he didn't show. You don't suppose Jackie boy got in the mood and caught the Christmas spirit, do you? The kind that comes in pints? No, he wasn't that sort of Joe. Well, your answer's simple. Hire a new one. They're hired through an agency. I called the one we do business with, and they're fresh out of Jack Frost. And I've got to get one, Candy. Otherwise, I come down ten notches in the opinion of the brass. 
I don't want you to think I'm unsympathetic, Myra, but what can I do? Well, you get around, you know people, find me somebody, anybody, who'll take over the job of being Jack Frost. <sighs> well, okay, I'll do the best I can, Myra. Candy, you're a deer. <laughs> yeah, one of Santa's deers. Okay, I'll try and find you a Jack Frost, Myra, but don't hold it against me if he turns out to look more like Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> I went home and looked up the Webster definition of soft. It said soft, easily yielding to pressure. That was me, Candy Matson, girl dope. Here I had all my Christmas shopping to do, and I agreed to find a substitute for Jack Frost. I had no idea where to start. So I changed into something red and green for a stop and go, also for Christmas, and went over to see my friendly advisor, Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt is a photographer, and excellent, too, now that he doesn't have the sherry shivers or the pork palsies. He lives on California Street, just kitten rompers from old St. Mary's, with a statue of Sun Yat Sen for company in a park next door. Candy doll, how delightful. Do come in, won't you? Thanks, Rembrandt. Oh, Pat, you're acquainted with my friend Diogenes Murphy, aren't you? Oh, yes. Hello again, Mr. Murphy. Well, good afternoon, lad. You look prettier than you did the last time I saw you. Uh-oh, here comes the blarney. Uh, young lady, Diogenes Murphy, the honest Irishman, never says a word he doesn't mean. Now, how do you think I managed to sell so many used cars at me place out on Vanis Avenue? Huh? Because you're an honest Irishman. <laughs> oh, bo -bo -bo, you're so right, lad. <laughs> uh, incidentally, if you need a good car, I can get you one at a very reasonable... Diogenes? Oh, sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to barge in on you like this, Rembrandt. Well, don't be ridiculous, dear. No, don't be. Think nothing of it, lad. I'm on my way now. Uh, Rembrandt and I were only discussing the situation of the world. And to what conclusion did you come? Uh, it stinks. <laughs> The bottom of the afternoon to the both of you. <laughs> oh, he's quite a boy. Yes, I'm very fond of Diogenes. What brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. <laughs> yes. Now, getting on with our conversation, what brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. Maybe the needle's bad. Shall we try again? I know how you feel. I reacted the same way myself. I'll give you the pocket-sized edition. The brownstone department store is without a Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. He didn't show up for work this morning. I said I'd find him a new one. Oh, that's very sweet of you, Dove. Very dumb of me, Dove. I know of only one character who even remotely looks like Jack Frost. I met him up in Alaska when I was traveling with the USO. Won't do you much good down here, will it? No. That's why I came to see you, Rembrandt. Don't you keep a, a cross file on models you've used in photography? As a matter of fact, I do. Here in this little book. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Men, thin, extremely. I have just one, Pietro Tarantello. Would you care for a Sicilian Jack Frost? In Sicily, yes. Hey, what's that? Where? On that chair next to you. Oh, that's the afternoon paper, dear. Diogenes left it, I imagine. Yes, but on the front page. Here's the whole story about the missing Jack Frost on the front page. Ooh, what he got in his Christmas stocking. A slug through the head. That's no way to treat Jack Frost. And here's a picture of the guy without his false icicles. What the ham... Looks like he stepped right out of an 1890 Shakespearean play. I hate to say this, Rembrandt, but he resembles you. I take back what I said. Rembrandt. Divorce yourself from that tone of voice, Candy. I don't like it. Rembrandt, I've got an idea. You usually do. You like little children. Can't stand them. You like to talk to people. I abhor conversation. You like to be charming. Lost me charm. Gay. Lost me gay. With the help of a few icicles, Ducky, you're going to be Jack Frost. <laughs> Rembrandt fought, he argued, he paced the floor, he had the vapors, he fainted. I brought him too. I won the argument. I got my friend Myra Fisher on the phone and informed her that one R. Watson would assume the role of Jolly Jack Frost on the morrow. She was delighted. I couldn't say the same for Rembrandt. Then I went home. I was greeted by a sound very much like that of a phone ringing. Using my keen instincts, I figured it was the phone. It was. Hello, Candy Matson. Uh, how do you do, Miss Matson? Uh, allow me to introduce myself. Allowed. Uh, my name is Burke, Prentice Burke. I'm the first assistant vice president of the Brownstone. Brownstone? Oh, yes, that's a store of some kind, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, now, the reason for my call. Uh, there has been, uh, shall I say, a rather unfortunate occurrence in our store today. Mm, so I read. I need the help of a professional sleuth. Uh, you were highly recommended by the head of our advertising department, Miss Myra Fisher. Aha, uh -huh. the thick plotting. I beg your pardon. Oh, no need to. You didn't do anything. Okay, care to talk to me now, Mr. Burke? Oh, I'd much rather have you come down to my office, Miss Batson. Uh, this matter is uh, of an extremely confidential nature. I'm your girl, then. 
figuratively speaking. How long will you be there? Uh, as long as necessary. Uh, that's up to you. Very well. I'll be there in half an hour if I can find a place to park. <laughs> I only had time for a fast change, so I made it from Andescray to Taboo. I sniffed at it and felt I was on the right scent. Then I climbed in my car, drove down Kearney Street, waved a crisp single under the nose of a hotel doorman and had my car taken care of. Then into the brownstone and up to Mr. Prentice Burke's office. I flipped a hip past the girl's secretary and walked on in. Burke was waiting for me, that was obvious. I could tell by the expression on his face it was worried look number 12B. How do you do, Mr. Burke? I'm Candy Matson. Uh, oh, uh, sit down, won't you? Mm, thank you. Now, our subject is what? Uh, a man named Jordan. That's on another network. I beg your pardon? Oh, that's all right. Uh, now, about this Jordan. Uh, yes, uh, Ralph Jordan, to be exact. Well, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought you wanted to talk about Jack Frost. Uh, that's just it. He was Jack Frost. Uh-oh, me and my big mouth. He was working here up until yesterday afternoon. And maybe you read about it. He was found shot today. Yes, yes, I read about it. That's the reason I've called you. Why didn't you have your own store detectives take over, Mr. Burke? Uh, no, no. Uh, that would never do. I want no one in the store to know what's going on. Ah, intrigue. Uh, quite possibly. I have reason to suspect that Jordan was killed by someone in our employ. I want to find out who that someone was before the police do and get it splashed all over the front pages. Publicity, can't you say? Uh, well, business has been off for uh, a whole year, and any bad breaks in the press would hurt us that much more. Maybe you've got a point there. I don't know. I know I have. Okay, I'll take the job. You say you have a suspicion. What is it? Well, nothing tangible. It's just a feeling I have. Oh, that's a big help. Well, I'll mush around and see what I can pick up. I'll bill you tomorrow for my first day's work. It's much easier to sustain a friendship on a daily basis. I left Burke looking as though someone had just called his store a bazaar. It was closing time, so I hefted my way through the crush and retrieved my car from the doorman. The Hall of Justice is right on my way home, so I decided to drop in on my old pal Mallard, Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A nice guy to serve coffee to on Sunday mornings if you could ever lasso him. I never could get strong enough rope. Candy, what brings you around here? I hate to have my Christmas ruined so early. What about that Jack Frost character? Oh, yeah. Poor guy got it good. Where'd you find him? In his apartment over on 17th. He lived near Seal Stadium. Why so interested, Candy? Rembrandt's a dead ringer for the guy. I still don't get that. The gal who's head of advertising for the Brownstone was going out of her head for another Jack Frost. I talked Rembrandt into taking the job. <laughs> does sound funny, doesn't it? Bring me up to date, Mallory. Did you get any dope on the killing? Nothing but a forty-five slug out of the guy's wall. Ballistics is checking it now. Nothing else? If I did, I should tell you. No. Oh, I guess not. This goes beyond just a normal curiosity, Candy. What are you drilling for? Oh, it's only that I'm worried about Rembrandt. I got him the job. I'm responsible. I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Ask a silly question, Mallard, and you get a silly answer. Okay, let's forget it. How's about dinner tonight? I've fought this thing long enough. Okay. Uh, Candy. Uh, yes, Mallard? We've known each other a good long time, haven't we? That's right. Ever since the fair on Treasure Island. We've had our little quarrels, little misunderstandings. Oh, but they never seem to last long, though, do they? No. That's why I feel I have every right to ask you a question. Wait, yes, I'd say you do, Mallard. Maybe I'll ask you tonight. No, 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 go ahead. Now's as good a time as any. Perhaps it is, Candy. You get around a lot. You meet people. Do you know where I can get a couple of tickets to the Rose Bowl game? My brain lit up like a Roman candle. I stormed for the door, turned back, stood there, my jaw waggling helplessly. Then I stuck my tongue out at Mallard and left. It was the only thing I could think of doing. Oh, he can make me so mad. But inside half an hour after I got home, I started to laugh. <laughs> Felt much better. Just as I was puttering around getting ready, the apartment buzzer buzzed. That Mallard, much too early. But I was wrong. It wasn't Mallard. Well, Myra, what a surprise. 
Do come in, won't you? No, thanks, Candy. A friend of mine's waiting in his car outside. He's driving me home. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't stay for a moment? So, my dear. I just dropped by to leave this. Merely a little t- token of thanks for getting me off the hook. Oh, Myra, th- there wasn't any need to do that. Just a few pair of old stockings, dear. Getting me my new Jack Frost means more than you know. Here, please take them, oh. along with my very deepest thanks. Oh, thanks so much. A girl can always use them. Are you all set with my friend, Mr. Watson? Oh, yes. He came in this afternoon and filled out his withholding tax and so on. Very nice. I think you'll find him very efficient, Myra. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, pardon me. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, Mallard. Oh, silly of me. I must have jumped a foot. Oh, that's all right. He frightens me, too. Myra, I'd like to have you meet Inspector Mallard. Inspector, Miss Fisher. How do you do? Oh, fine, thank you. Now that I've caught my breath. Do forgive me, Candy, but I must rush. See you soon, I hope. Tomorrow, Myra, I'll be down to see how my lad's doing as Jack Frost. Thanks for the stalking. Well, aren't you going to invite me in? No, I'm not. Here's my coat right here. What's our hurry? Come on, let's go. I'm starved. I thought we could have a cocktail here before we left. You thought wrong. Two tickets to the Rose Bowl. From now on, you earn your cocktails, Mallard. <laughs> We went downstairs, and as I locked the front door, a car was just driving off. It was Myra, and she waved. And driving, if these tired old eyes hadn't deceived me, was Mr. Prentice Burke, vice president of the Brownstone. Well. Oh, well. Mallard and I climbed into our car and drove out to the cliff house. It was that kind of an evening. We had dinner, and after, I suggested we walk a bit. The night was crisp and clear, and the evening star was hanging out above the dark waters of the Pacific like an iridescent Japanese lantern. We cut across a little road above Sutro Baths where an old car barn had once stood and worked our way over the cliffs and stood high above Land's End. It was exhilarating. Penny for your thoughts, Candy. Inflation is still here. All right, I get two pennies. Well, I was just thinking, Mallard, dear, when you see a star in the sky, soft water below, feel Christmas in the air... How can there be violence in the world? An age-old question, pal. One I can't answer. I'm too small. Hey, you're cold. I'd better put my arm around you. Mallard, no. The headlights from that automobile are shining right down on us. Mallard. Jenny, what's wrong? Got your flashlight with you? Sure. Also, my gun and my handcuffs. Anything else we need? A mortar, maybe? The lights from that car. They shone on something. Down there, under that tree. Oh, Candy, just for once, can't you stop digging up a mystery? Be human? I am being human. Come on, Mallard, I want to see what's under that tree. We scrambled around through the brush, slipped into some sliding sand, and rode the crest down to the tree. It wasn't easy to get around some of those brambles, but get there I fully intended doing, because what I saw was red, bright red. You, you okay, Candy? Nothing that a, a new pair of nylons won't fix. Shoot the flashlight over the, this, this way a bit, Mallard. Uh, there. That's it. Now, do you think I'm dreaming things up? Uh, what is it? Wait till I hold it up. Well, looks like some kind of a costume. Right. And look, if those aren't bloodstains, I'm a Labrador retriever. No, you're Candy Matson. Those are bloodstains. How was your boy dressed when you found him? Torn slacks, sweater, shoes, no socks. This was most likely his costume, then. Yeah. Don't move around too much, Candy. I want to have a good look at the ground. Hey, what are you doing down there? Who's that? The police. Now get up here and don't try any tricks. That's all right, officer. This is Inspector Mallard. Homicide. Oh, sorry, Inspector. That's all right. Stay right where you are. We'll be right up. Now, this is a break, Candy. I want you to drive me to a phone. I'll leave the officer here to guard the place. You can go home. I've got work to do here, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. And for once, we had dinner before you had a chance to date, break the date. <laughs> this baby was hard to reconstruct. Was the guy knocked off out there at Land's End, or was he bumped off at his apartment, the killer driving way out to the beach and hiding the costume? Only time would tell. I went home, climbed into bed, and logged about eight hours, enough to give me fuel for the next day. In the morning, I went down to the brownstone. The shoppers were already swarming through the place. 
I spotted a floor walker and strolled over to him. Pardon me, sir. I, I said, pardon me, sir. I'm very busy, young lady. Make it as brief as possible. I... You do work here, don't you? Of course. You are the floor walker assigned to this section? That is correct. Come to the point, please. Of all the... Well, I'm a good mind to report you. As you wish. As I said, I'm very busy. Now, what is it you wanted to know? The words are like gall in my mouth now, but where do I find Jack Frost? Right over there, in the back, two aisles over. Thank you. Not at all. Very much. Of all the high-handed characters, people like that make me steam. I was getting up a full head of dander, but it simmered out before I had a chance to boil over. Because as I rounded a corner, I saw Frosty Boy, or Rembrandt, if you choose, up on his platform with the cutest little blonde kid sitting in his lap. Well, well, well. Look who we have here. A great big boy. Hello there, son. Hello, Jack Frost. What is your name? Topper. Topper. My, what a fine name. How old are you, Topper? Five and a half. Five and a half. Well, you must go to school, Topper. Which one? Garfield. Garfield. That's a good school. Now, tell me, uh, what would you like to have me tell Santa Claus to bring you for Christmas, Topper? An electric train and a baseball bat, and I like to be in the seals for Lefty Duel. Well, I'll see what I can do to arrange that, Topper. I'll tell Santa Claus. Bye now. Goodbye, and thank you, and Merry Christmas. I hope you can make the boy's wish come true. O'Doul could use him. Candy, oh, I'm so glad you're here, Doug. Duck around into the back room for a moment. I've got to talk to you. Aren't you working, Frosty Boy? I got ten minutes off every hour. I'll take the break now. Right around there, Candy. Okay, I'll see you in a moment. <laughs> matter, Rembrandt? Even under those icicles, you look warm under the collar. Here, look at this. Every now and then, one of these moppets toddles up to me with a Christmas letter in its hand. A little red-headed girl handed me this about half an hour ago. I've been shaking ever since. Let me see. Dear Jack Frost, a word to the wise is sufficient. When you take your lunch hour, keep on going. Don't come back. Otherwise, you'll meet the same fate as your predecessor. Hmm. Just about what I expected. Candy, you mean to say that you're deliberately using me as a sacrificial lamb? By no means, Ducky. Go ahead, take your lunch. Then do as the note says, keep on going. As a matter of fact, why don't you take off now? I'll meet you at your place in about an hour. That's the best news I've heard since Nelson's victory at Trafalgar. I whipped upstairs, reported to Prentice Burke, got my first day's check, and on my way out, told his secretary she'd better get Burke some smelling salts. Then I went back down on the floor again. Sure enough, there was my boy, the floor walker. I wanted to have a few more words with him. Oh, you again. If you don't mind. I was just up to see Miss Myra Fisher. She wasn't in. Have you seen her down here? No, and what's more, I won't see her all day. She phoned saying she was feeling ill. Most inconsiderate, I must say, during the holiday rush. Yes, I must say. Uh, could you give me her address? She's a friend of mine. I've got to see her. Her address? Well, yes. I write it down here on one of my cards for you. Myra Fisher, 227F, Union Street. There. Thank you. You're so kind. <laughs> I had all the ammunition I wanted. A check signed by Burke and a card written by the floor walker. His name was Simon Liggett. With that, I ducked into a phone booth and called Mallard. Homicide, Mallard speaking. Good boy. This is Candy. What did you find out at Land's End last night? A couple of very juicy footprints. They give us nothing. Did you make any casts of them? Why, sure. Mind if I borrow a couple of them for a few hours, Mallard? Well, I don't see how it will hurt. Sure, okay. Thanks, Mallory, dear. I'll be by in a moment. And uh, I want to borrow you, too. I stopped by the Hall of Justice, got the cast of the footprints, shoved Mallard into the car, and then picked up Rembrandt. The thing was only a hunch, but my hunches have paid off, so I never ignore them. First, we went out to an address on Fifth Avenue near Clement. We got in the back door and went to work. Nothing made sense there. So we drove over to Reseda Way in the marina. Again, we got in and did some sleuthing. This time, we hit the jackpot. A pair of shoes in the closet matched the casts we had brought with us. 
Rembrandt, go out in the kitchen and, and see if this place has any ketchup. I'm not hungry, Doug, but I'll look. What are you up to, Candy? We've got enough to swing a case here. I'm working for a voluntary confession, Mallard. Tell me, what was the position that the, the Jack Frost was in when you found him dead? In a chair, like that one. His head slumped down on his chest. Good. Here's the concept, though. When are you putting it on? You. What? Without the burner relish, Ducky. Sit down there, will you, Ember? Now, just go limp and let your head hang down. That's it. Now for a little seasoning. Oh, Candy, you're smearing me with this sticky stuff. Oh, no, for the sake of art. Hold still. There. How does he look, Mallard? Why, all the... Candy, it looks like the same guy, the real thing. Good. Now, Rembrandt, you just sit like that. Don't move. Mallard, you duck into that closet over there and I'll hide in here. We've got a good view of the front door from both places, okay? Okay. There are times, Candy, when I admit I admire your genius. Genius, genius. Come on, let's hide. The golden shafts of sun splashing in through the window from the ocean slowly turned pink, then purple, and into twilight. The minute ticked on. Once. <laughs> bless you, but quiet, though, Rembrandt. You'll mess up your ketchup. Five minutes, ten. Then we heard muffled footsteps coming down the hall and a key inserted in the lock of the apartment door. No! Oh, no! It can't be! The old fool I killed! No, no. Okay, buddy, oh, that'll be about what? enough. Oh, no. You, you... Get him, Mallard. He's ducking. I'll get him. Oh, no. oh. Oh. Nice tackle, Mallard. All right, Mac. You're going to remain peaceful, or do I have to give you a little tap? No, no. I'll be quiet. You got me. I did it. I did it to the both of them. I killed them. I, I killed them. I killed both of them. Both of them? Yeah. I was behind the sofa. The sofa. The girl... Uh, Jack Frost, the sofa. The sofa. <laughs> Wait a minute, Mallard. I, I had to do it. I couldn't. Oh. But then they were going to do it. Oh, Mallard. Do it. More trouble, Candy? I killed both of them. I'm glad I killed Yes. An old friend of mine. Was my, the late Myra Fisher. I had to do it. The whole thing was jealousy. Not the jealousy of a man for a woman, but the jealousy of a man for a job. Simon Liggett had been with the Brownstone for almost 20 years. He'd worked himself up from the stock boy to a place where he'd been promised the job of head of advertising and promotion. He almost got it, except at the last moment, Prentice Burke gave the position to Myra Fisher. That had only been two weeks before. He knew that Myra was on a probationary term, so he did everything he could to undermine her. Little things like changing ad copy, sending out false stories to newspapers. He figured that if he could keep the store without a Santa Claus helper, he'd break Myra's back and get the job by the first of the year. He paid a visit to the first Jack Frost and tried to bribe him into quitting, but the guy would have none of it. There was a struggle. Liggett lost his head and whipped out a gun and shot him. He was still in his costume, so Liggett stripped him, put some old clothes on him, drove out to Land's End and ditched his costume. Then he felt sure there would be no Jack Frost the next day, but that's when Myra met me and I talked Rembrandt into taking over. By this time, Liggett was in a frenzy and would stop at nothing. He trailed Myra and Burke to Myra's home, killed her, took her body over to his place, and ditched it behind the sofa. The next morning, he wrote a note to Rembrandt and gave it to one of the little girls waiting in line to see him. Fear and envy were taking their toll on the poor guy's mind. I wanted to compare the handwriting, so I had Burke write me a check and Liggett write Myra's address on a card. Also, we had the footprint cast. Between the two, everything pointed toward Liggett. That's when I staged my little parlor charade with Rembrandt playing the part of a corpse. The sight, with Rembrandt's resemblance to the dead Jack Frost, would shatter anybody into a confession. But Christmas, in spite of everything, is a lovely time of year. And there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> Three of them for me, as a matter of fact. Mr. Prentice Burke, who sent me a very nice check for my efforts. Rembrandt Watson, who, out of sheer love for the job, went back to playing Jack Frost for all the kids at the Brownstone. And last but not least, Inspector Ray Mallard. 
He gave me a Christmas sock right on my mouth, just where any well-placed Christmas sock should go. Listen again next week at this same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial Candy Matson and a Merry Christmas to you all. Yukon 28209. <laughs> Tonight were Helen Klebe as Myra Fisher, Lou Tobin as Prentice Burke, and John Grover as Simon Liggett. Jack Thomas plays the role of Rembrandt Watson, and Henry Leff is heard as Inspector Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious, with the exception of the part of Topper, which was played by himself. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. That was Jack Frost from Candy Matson, Yukon 28209, here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. I chose that episode for our holiday pleasure. Uh, I listened to this to prepare for this podcast three times. Not because I was like, oh, I want to make sure I got that right, or because I loved it so much, I just listened to it again and listened to it again. I enjoyed it so much. And again, I'm not even sure what the plot was, and I just don't care. I guess, <laughs> you know, it, it's the snappy repartee. Mm -hmm. It's the moving uh, from scene to scene. It's the relationship stuff. There are moments in this I can't wait to discuss. And yeah, I get it. Some guy killed the Jack Frost guy at a department store. and I get it. But who cares? Like, the plot <laughs> is secondary to... Everything else, which is really weird. I will I will get to the plot later, but I also we we just kinda have to address this show is between the writing and the performance of the Masters couple, like so ahead of their time. Oh, so yeah. incredibly ahead of time. This is funny in a very contemporary way. It is it's snappy. It reminds me, and you know that snappy dialogue uh, was very popular before sure. this. Um, I think there's a, a contemporary quality to the rat a tat tat. It doesn't feel like an antiquated throwback no. to the 1930s. Um, it, it feels really they at can... ease with itself in a way that feels contemporary, and it's self-referential, and it is just has this confidence and this perpetual smirk on its face. They can jump from. Rat a tat tat to absurd to farcical. I mean, it it just can move on a dime. To even back to solving the case and the mystery and a little bit of suspense. I mean, it, it does tether itself to it. It, it. Yeah, I would say, in my opinion, this is one of the most grounded episodes of mm -hmm. Candy Matson that I've heard plot wise. Uh, it yep. doesn't veer off into too much weird or surreal. It has a pretty straightforward detective case. Mm -hmm. anchoring all the uh, wit and one-liners. Speaking of, I was going to start writing down, and then I went, why bother? Joshua has made a list of his favorite one-liners <laughs> from the show. I marked a couple. Let's but, hear them. Uh, again, I, you kind of give up with Candy Matson. <laughs> it's so many. It sounds like an insult, but it's actually a compliment, because it is quantity over quality method yep. where it doesn't seem interested in having every single one be the greatest, but the cumulative effect <laughs> of the the sheer number of jokes, mm -hmm. a smile never leaves your face while Correct. listening to it. So and it knows that like one of these is going to be personal to you. Like you are going to find one of these things blindingly hilarious, even if not everyone does. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I just like really simple uh, speed by lines that aren't even really jokes like i refrain from hurtling this ashtray at you candy only because of our long acquaintance because that to me <laughs> um really speaks to how this script works is that uh monty is just not going to just write a line of dialogue <laughs> right like, and everything's going to have an, an image or some type of quippiness to it 
whether it is a laugh line or not. No one has a straightforward line of dialogue. No. It's an entire script. No. The innuendo of the line of, uh, he'd be a great guy to wake up and make coffee for on a Sunday morning. or <laughs> yes. There is some, like, some innuendo like, that's filthy. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. My favorite isn't a line, but it's the exchange, and I didn't write it all down. Uh, but with when Candy is trying to talk Rembrandt well, into like, taking the job, the needle skipped. And the <laughs> yeah, just the well, you like children. I hate children. children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's not the exact line, but it just has yeah. that rhythm. You like hanging out with people. I don't like to socialize, and it's just <laughs> he, he just instantly <laughs> negates everything. Yep. You know, you're charming. Uh, lost my charm and gay. Lost my gay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to touch on something, and I'm sure lines will come into our head as we're having this discussion. But I find it fascinating for 1949, if I'm right, that the insinuation is that when she goes to Rembrandt's house, that he's with his boyfriend. Well, and, yeah, I mean, I think it's very clear. Okay, okay. It's when you say San Francisco, he, yeah, but when you say yeah. <laughs> Very clearly, let's talk about the fact this is 1949. They it's not did, explicit, but it's also not a like vaguely hinted it's not, wink. It's not a hint. It's not a wink. It's but it's not explicit. But I find that really fascinating for 1949 that they just went, yeah, that's how that is, and that Candy's character is okay. Not 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 just okay with it. That's very normal. Like her reaction yeah. is there's there's nothing this odd. Is my about best friend. That. Yeah, and how he says, "I, you really adore him." Yes, I adore him, and and all of that has nothing to do with the plot. That guy being there mm -hmm. has yeah. nothing, had nothing to do with the plot. So think about that. This doesn't narratively drive anything forward to happen there. It seems intentional to make a statement to me. Discuss. <laughs> I just think uh, the contemporary idea is make a statement. I think it was just artists reflecting the community they probably worked in. Sure. And like all the cleverness in here, knowing how to get around uh, sensors and things like that. Still, um, do you it, find it brave to even put it in I for the time period? Like... It's hard to know. It, it depends on, like on the context and the time period. I do think we suffer from a lot of chronological snobbery where we always presume everything everywhere at all times did not have our level of perceived in enlightenment um which is not to say that this would not be acceptable to have an explicitly gay character on the radio at this time right it would not be um but i think it was smart i would describe it more than brave because they are smart enough to know how to do it and this wasn't entirely innovative in that pre-code early 1930s films were right. lousy with Rembrandt Watson-esque gay-coded <laughs> characters. And, and they are catering... It, and to have it be... And it's a regional um, right. yeah, show. Right. Yeah, that's what I thought of. And like, it's, for the audience they know they have, this is not going to step on any toes. Did you... But it might be that this is what keeps them from having a bigger audience. Did either of you find it interesting? Oh, yeah. I think it's a very interesting part of That whole scene of But, was I mean, just... I think it's been present in every Candy Matson. Not like that. It. But it, yeah. what happens is he gets off the sauce and gets okay. gayer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can we talk about that? So it was implied, and I found it interesting. That was my next thing I wanted to discuss, that they had made the decision that this character was now no longer drinking. Yeah. The very quickly in the shivers. series, he was off the sauce. Do we know why? it was? I wonder if there was complaints or they felt like it was it might have been one of those like things where you're like okay fine you're gonna complain about our drinking jokes let's make him gay take that <laughs> you must be like, i do one voice i can be drunk or gay you make a call <laughs> <laughs> all right gay it is odd that they make such a big deal out of it, that, that he doesn't drink. Un unless he, maybe it was a personal thing. Maybe uh, Jack Thomas had a drinking yeah. problem. He finally decided to stop drinking and, and they, he asked them to write it out. I, I, it, it seems out of step with Candy Matson because of the tone of the rest of the show to be concerned about advocating drinking, uh, particularly in 1949. But who, yeah. who knows? It could have yeah. been a, a local sponsor who was like, hey, can you not have him drunk all the time? I mean, I, I really miss drunk. Uh, Rembrandt. Yeah, he frankly. was a different character. Yeah, he, he really was. I mean, he's still really funny, but, you know, it's like I liked family-friendly 1990s Robin Williams, but I love 
Coke crazy 1970s <laughs> Robin Williams. <laughs> right. Both funny. Different energy. To pivot back to the plot, because I, I agree with what's been said here, like this really does function like the, the plot of most detective stories you'll hear of like there is a crime and it is investigated and Candy uses some clever ploy to figure out who did it. And like so many of these things, the like well done, well executed, like some of the others, like and the motivation is unbelievable. You didn't get a promotion, so you went on a killing spree. That's not a criticism of this story. That's a criticism of like most crime stories are about something small and dumb, but it makes for an interesting plot. Yeah, I mean, but if you listen to enough episodes of Dateline in 48 hours, you realize Fair that's enough. truly what <laughs> people enough. murder each other over. Sometimes smaller, far more petty things. Like, I can't cover the mortgage this month. Better kill my wife. I mean, yeah. <laughs> why yep, am I laughing? Small? <laughs> right. <laughs> that way she'll never know. <laughs> they, they often make that little sense in real life. But we expect our artificial worlds to make more sense than the real world. We take more comfort yes. from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and like I said, I ha- I've mentioned it before. I had that creative writer teacher who always said, you know, real life is no excuse for bad fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but there's that that imaginary cop in my head talking to this guy of like, so you wanted to get her fired. And the best thing you could think of was to kill like two people at least. <laughs> Monty tries to cover that by saying things like, and by that time he was just so uh, oh, out yeah. of his mind. Right. Why didn't he just start by killing her? Yes. He wanted her job. That would have been mm-hmm. straight to the point. But I thought, oh, well, that would be too suspicious. Yep. And, cool. and he didn't intend to kill the first Jack Frost. He just, according to Candy, lost his cool and happened to be carrying a loaded gun. <laughs> <laughs> right. To me, the the fight scene in Elf the movie (laughs) is how he killed jack frost with legos flying everywhere and oh there's a sports joke that i thought i'd turn the tables and and see if eric can explain to me if there's something particularly funny about it that i don't understand and that's when the little kid asks for an electric train and a baseball bat and i'd like to be in the seals for lefty o'duel the seals the seals i know was a baseball team is Lefty O'Duel somebody you no, know? No, and I don't know what the Seals are either. I don't think that... What baseball team was the Seals? I don't know. I'm asking you. <laughs> I think it's all made up. That's why it went by me. I think that's a... Or it's a reference that is long forgotten. But the Seals is not a baseball team. If I get a bunch of emails... Yeah, I'll be wrong. I'm forwarding them to you. The only thing I can think of is that there was a minor league or semi-pro team in San Francisco called the Seals uh, that they're referring to, possibly. That would be, but I don't know. None of that is I'm popular. I'm guessing it was somebody who was real at the time because, mm-hmm. real at the time, and now he's become imaginary. Sounds like a, sounds like but, a local reference yeah, to me. Yeah, because it's so Come full in. of local references. Little League, maybe? You know, <laughs> yeah. Lefty O'Doul, that kid. <laughs> that second grader. That second grader. <laughs> I'm going to help you out and ask you an easier one. Sure. What's the Rose Bowl game, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> you serious? Is that where they try to throw rose petals in yeah. Rama? Can- I don't know. Uh, no, Rose Bowl is the original bowl game. The reason we have bowl games is because the stadium that this was played is what in. I wanted. <laughs> I wanted the full Cliff Clavin. The reason they're, <laughs> the reason they're called bowl games is the original. Uh, the Big Ten Pac-12 championship game was played in the stadium in Pasadena, California that was called the Rose Bowl. It was called that because the shape of the stadium looked like a Rose Bowl, a bowl that you would put roses in. What Be- shape distinguishes this is a good bowl for yeah, roses? Yeah, that's a whole other thing uh, I don't know. But that, the like name the- of the stadium is the Rose Bowl. So when they wanted more bowl games, like, oh, that's really popular – Instead of calling them something else, they all became bowl games. So sugar bowl, peach bowl, whatever the bowl game is. So toilet bowl, bowl, toilet bowl. <laughs> so the word bowl in bowl games, it became synonymous with post season after the seasons over competitions, bowl games sponsored by different companies. So it's the Rose bowl, bowl is the name of the stadium, but also the name of the game. But the Rose bowl uh, is no longer what it was. Look, this is, we do not have time for this, but the entire 
uh, NCAA football, college football is so screwed up right now. All these traditions, all the things that used to be, how it worked is all gone. And it's because players now get paid. Uh, they can transfer teams. It's become they get paid directly now? Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, not directly, directly, oh. but they're allowed to accept money from anybody now. And gotcha. so it's, it's yes, an yes. easy workaround. Um, and for example, University of Minnesota just announced we can't get a kid to transfer here. It costs us at least a million dollars. We got to pay the kid somehow a million dollars to get here. That was just last week. People are very mad about it, just so you know. I tuned out five minutes ago. Oh, I know. <laughs> but you did ask me a question I, I can did. answer. I did, and you did it very well. Uh, it's so messed up. I got two uh, two favorite lines to offer to the discussion here. One of them, uh, you, you already know I love because I put it on a coaster, uh, is the Thick Plotins. Oh, yes. Oh, I yeah. I love that line. And then the mention of Jordan is like, he's on another network. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Another, but what was the line where the guy said, can I have a moment of your time or something like that? I, I, this is going to be really hard for me to pull out of your guy's head. There was a great line, and I should have written it down. Yeah, you should have. Uh, Shame on you. Yeah. Consider me bothered. I don't know what it was. It was something like it, she had just, such a great some sort of quippy Candy Matson. Yeah, line. it was great. You should <laughs> listen to the episode. <laughs> I did three times and I still can't remember it. Who are you guys? What am I doing here? What's this podcast about? <laughs> Tell us about the Rose Bowl. <laughs> okay. In nine, so the Rose Bowl. Uh, are we ready to vote? Sure. I uh, vote that the NCAA college football. <laughs> Should restructure. No, I, this is to me, not only stands the test of time, for me personally, this is classic. This is one of my favorite things I've ever listened to. And I have a new holiday tradition. I'm listening to this every year. This is a really fun thing. And boys, gentlemen, next year, we should be doing this one on stage for the holiday Ooh, season. It'll be a lot of fun. It'll be super fun. Would people understand? I'm not even sure I understand that a Christmas sock in the mouth. I'm hoping meant to kiss. <laughs> that was the thing. Like, uh, it's sort of like it's a little pun on like a little punch in the mouth, and it's a kiss. Or did he actually gag her? Yeah. Right, like, right. Actually, put a, a sock in her mouth. It's like, did this get really dark and a little sexy? <laughs> <laughs> but nobody drinks, okay? <laughs> right, right. Uh, um, I always love Candy Madsen. Uh, they're always entertaining. It's so sad that there are so few episodes yeah. in, in, that have survived uh, the cruelty of time. To my taste, though, if I'm comparing Candy Madsen to Candy Madsen, it's a little... It's a little too straightforward compared to some of the weirder ones. My taste runs more toward like the Symphony of Death and uh, the, the cable car murder. Uh, oh yeah, I love that one too. Or the the weird one with the opera singer, Devil yeah, the Deep Freeze. I, I, I like it yeah. a, a little more surreal and a little more uh, breaking through the fourth wall. But that's minor stuff. So not a classic Candy Matson for me, but Candy Matson itself is a classic. I know we do a lot of. Preaching the gospel of Candy Matson that I, I feel a little bit bad about of like we should maybe not be so freaky weird supportive but it's just so good, it's uncanny and it's so much fun yeah and it continues to be fun in a very fresh and present way that is not just like oh this is what it was like back then and wasn't that nice like this is if these shows were on TV right now I wouldn't miss an episode yeah um, yeah. And occasionally some gruesome moments, too. I forgot to mention that the image of the Myra's body stuffed behind the couch. Yeah, yeah they, they're not afraid to have a dark, somber moment in the midst of all this madcap zaniness. The thing that saddens me about this discovery of Candy Matson and how much I love it is how badly I want just an hour with the actors and the writers oh of this show to ask so many questions. There's so much lost and forgotten. There isn't a lot of information about this show out there. Uh, I just wish they would have written a book. You know, I yeah, want. I to, just want to know so many things. Wonder like, if like this group just sort of thought like, oh, we're a little local thing. Yeah. We're doing well locally, but we're never going to be that much of a big deal to, yeah. to know. Time that, to call it a day. You know that 
80 years later, we think this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah, so 80 years from now, they're going to be like, why didn't Tim, Joshua, and Eric write a book? Because <laughs> <laughs> that ain't happening. No, I really no, wish. Like, I, oh, they wrote a book. Ooh. Just little things like we could say, so why did you write him to stop drinking? I just, you know, I just want to know, man. All right, Tim, tell them stuff. Go visit GoolishLights.com, home of this podcast. You can find other episodes there, other episodes of Candy Madsen. You'll hear us talk about how much we love it again. Um, you can also then vote in polls, leave comments, let us know what you think about these episodes. You can link to our social media pages. You can go to our Threadless store through a link and buy like a T-shirt or something like a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> something for your top half. Yeah, like a short sleeve, uh, but we'll keep you decent at the pool. And uh, you can also link to our Patreon store to get more high-quality material like this plug. <laughs> yes, go to patreon.com slash the morals. And once you become a patron, you can just fast forward through this crap <laughs> in a smug manner, knowing, yep, I don't have to listen to this anymore. Uh, I mean, there's nothing stopping people who don't give us money from fast forwarding <laughs> through this either. No, I've given them that idea because they probably never thought to do that. Uh, I wish that on the internet when you fast forward it, it went <laughs> like an old tape recorder. Someone should add that. But yeah, you should go to patreon.com slash the morals because uh, we have great patrons there and we should take the moment occasionally to thank them profusely because they do make this possible. This podcast is a quantity of work. <laughs> yep. and, uh, we seriously wouldn't do it for free. So thank you. Thank you and patrons. if you'd like to see us performing live, the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society Theater Company does live performances on stage of classic old-time radio drama and a lot of our own original work. You can find out where we're performing every month. We're performing somewhere, have been for seven, eight years as as it stands now at the time of the recording of this podcast. Uh, just go to ghoulishdelights.com and there you will find out where we're performing this month and what we're performing and a link to get tickets. If you can't get tickets, it's another perk to being a Patreon. We film them and we give the film footage uh, to our... Uh, uh, struggle with it. Yeah, to our Patreons. We post a video online, done. For our Patreons. <laughs> for our patrons. Thank yes. you. Post a video of the shows for our patrons. I'm going to try to remember that in the future. Because I almost said Zabruder for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eric's brain is all over me. <laughs> oh, forwards, what? back, <laughs> back to the left. What's uh, coming up next? Hey, I don't know if you guys know this, uh, but they did a radio adaptation of Charles Dickens' The Signal Man. No Just way. Uh, more than one. Uh, and so for the next time, I was thinking we'd listen to our seventh installment in our ongoing wow. series of annually listening to an adaptation of The Signal Man. Until then! Look out! Now tell me, uh, what would you like to have me tell Santa Claus to bring you for Christmas, Topper? An electric train and a baseball bat, and I like to be in the seals for Lefty Old Duel. We interrupt this podcast post credit sequence for a breaking news report from the Encyclopedia Britannica. American professional baseball player Lefty O'Doul was a left-handed power hitter who played 11 seasons in the major leagues and who amassed a stellar lifetime batting average of .349, whatever that means. After finishing his playing career, he became a noted minor league manager, including a 16-year stint as the manager of the San Francisco Seals. O'Doul also organized and led numerous exhibition tours to Japan that were credited with helping to establish the sport of baseball in that country. And now that I've saved us from a flurry of emails explaining who Lefty O'Doul was, we return to our regularly scheduled podcast post credit sequence. Well, I'll see what I can do to arrange that, Topper. I'll tell Santa Claus. Bye now. Goodbye, and thank you, and Merry Christmas.